all of the uranium in the reactor was separated from the intensely radioactive fission products. I shall never forget my wonderment as I stood next to the unshielded steel cans containing the uranium that only a few days earlier had been mixed with millions of curies of radioactivity. We were particularly proud of this because that tiny chemical plant was large enough to decontaminate the core of a one gigawatt molten salt breeder. You know, in one respect, a machine is a machine, but I guess anybody who's involved in designs of things gets sort of emotionally wedded to one thing over another. And I think the molten salt breeder was probably the one thing that he really had uh, a feeling in his heart for. There's this hot idea about using molten salts. High temperature is probably easier than high pressure. That was one of the best decisions I made, I think, despite the fact that the project was eventually terminated. But I still think that, well, eventually people will come back to this reactor. So I was born in 1974, which unfortunately was the same year the molten salt reactor was shut down. The whole program ended. So I can kind of mark the beginning of my life as uh, the beginning of the end for the molten salt reactor. We're far behind schedule, and we want to power the world with thorium, and we want to eliminate so many of the political and social problems that have come about because of our dependence on other energy sources. Really big star exploded as supernova, and this seeded the universe with everything heavier than iron. Now, two of the things that were created, thorium and uranium, kept some of that energy from the supernova explosion stored in their very nuclear structure. And some of this thorium and uranium was incorporated into our planet. Only thorium MSR is going to allow us to produce nuclear power without plutonium. There are no other options to making nuclear power and not making plutonium other than this approach. So this is the classic design for the molten salt reactor that came out of the Oak Ridge effort in the 1970s. It's what we call a single fluid reactor. It is a complex chemical undertaking in order to turn one of these reactors into a thorium breeder reactor. There had been Oak Ridge studies done on what's called the two-fluid reactor. And the two-fluid reactor is fundamentally different in that it separates the fuel, the uranium-233 fuel in flybe salt from a blanket flybe salt carrying thorium tetrafluoride. The challenge of this two-fluid reactor design, though, is the internal geometry of the reactor. The advantage, though, of keeping them separate is the simplification that can be realized in the reprocessing step. With the two-fluid reactor, it is a rather straightforward thing to move the fuel that has been bred in the blanket out of the blanket and get it back into the core, which is where you want it. You want it in the core salt. Thorium does not have a volatile hexafluoride. You can fluorinate it and fluorinate it and fluorinate all you want, and it will not change chemical state. It will stay thorium tetrafluoride. Uranium, on the other hand, does have a volatile hexafluoride. And this is why many of us feel that the uranium-thorium fuel cycle is a perfect fit with a molten salt reactor. This same trick doesn't work, by the way, in uranium plutonium fuels. They both have volatile hexafluorides, and so you can't undergo a separation using the simple technique of fluoride volatility. One of the things we want to do is to couple it to a gas turbine. It addresses tritium migration, but it also gives us the potential to radically reduce the form factor all the way down to supercritical CO2. And in fact, one of the original ideas was to use a molten salt reactor to drive open cycle air gas turbines and power a jet. So this is the crazy idea that kicked off the molten salt reactor. So there is just a little bit of precedent. This two fluid reactor design was also designed to be modular, to bring new nuclear power plants online quickly. They were into small modular reactors before small modular reactors were cool. Liquid fluoride reactors with their low pressure operation are particularly suitable to modular construction because one of the hardest things to get around is the large, heavy pressure vessel that's required when you use pressurized water reactors. Safety is one of the most important reasons to consider very seriously molten salt reactors. And this is because of the clever implementation that was demonstrated in the molten salt reactor experiment of the freeze plug and the drain tank. This is something that perhaps was not getting enough attention in the early 1970s. Now we know that if we want to have the public accept nuclear reactor technology, it has got to be very safe 
and it has got to be something that is easily explained to people. Now, I've explained the safety basis of the molten salt reactor to people many times, and I haven't had anyone who's unable to get it. Frozen plug. That's it. That's <laughs> it. A flattened pipe with uh, electrical heat, resistance heat on that one. So you invented the frozen plug one. A small port in the bottom of the reactor plugged by a frozen plug of salt. If all power was lost, that plug melted, the fuel drained into this drain tank. And the difference between the drain tank and the reactor vessel was the reactor vessel was not meant to lose any thermal energy. Uh, the only place you wanted to lose thermal energy was to give it up in the primary heat exchanger. The drain tank, on the other hand, is designed to maximize the rejection of thermal energy to the environment. Three paths. The path we take now, which is burning this very, very rare amount of uranium-235, or the path that has been investigated by a lot of advanced nuclear programs, the idea of burning in a fast reactor, uranium-238, or this new old idea, which is using thorium in a thermal spectrum reactor. We could imagine fueling a molten salt reactor with low enriched uranium. If we do that, the uranium mining and enrichment necessary will be comparable to what we do today in light water reactors. That path was weaponized and it continues to be a concern. Option two, we could imagine fast spectrum molten salt reactors. We would not need any more uranium mining or enrichment, but we're going to have a high inventory. Fuel looks small to a fast neutron. And there are chemical separation issues with fast spectrum uh, molten salt reactors that are going to be challenging. It's harder to get plutonium and uranium away from one another in fluoride than it is to get thorium and uranium away from one another. And finally, option three, which is obviously the option I favor, which is the thorium-fueled thermal spectrum molten salt reactor. No uranium or mining or enrichment are going to be necessary once we're in steady state. And this option will have the lowest of all of the fissile inventories. And that fissile inventory won't be plutonium. It will be uranium-233. That third path was not weaponized because of the unavoidable contamination of uranium-232, which was realized by Glenn Seaborg in 1944. What we would propose is to use many of the materials that are otherwise going to go to waste to a fully thorium-powered future. In this scenario, we put both our, our plutonium, our HEU, our U-233, all to productive use along with our thorium stockpiles. So I would make the case that if you have to choose your fissile currency from one of these three options, the safest and best bet and most efficient is to use uranium-233 and to choose the thorium option. Our fundamental motivation is that we share the dream that was put forward by Dr. Alvin Weinberg long ago of a world set free by the use of thorium as an essentially unlimited energy source. And I, I know it was said earlier that thorium's not a miracle. To me, it is a miracle. It's a miracle that there's a material on Earth that has such remarkable energy density that even worthless dirt is transformed into an energy resource greater than the richest crude oil or anthracite coal or any other resource you can imagine. To me, that is, that is truly a miracle. Every time mankind has been able to access a new source of energy, it has led to profound societal implications. You know, the Industrial Revolution and the ability to use chemical fuels was what finally did in slavery. Human beings have had slaves for thousands and thousands of years. And when we learned how to make carbon our slave, Instead of other human beings, we started to learn how to be able to be civilized people. I really believe that if we don't have access to affordable and clean energy, we will revert. We will go back to the way humans have been for thousands and thousands of years, which is where the powerful and the rich oppress the masses who live terrible lives trying to provide things for just a few people. We live much better lives today because we have learned how to use carbon. Okay, what about thorium? Thorium has a million times the energy density of a carbon-hydrogen bond. What could that mean for human civilization going out thousands, tens of thousands of years into the future? Because we're not going to run out of this stuff. Once we've learned how to use it at this kind of efficiency, we will never run out. It is simply too common.